Psalm 4 is a, another psalm of David. We're not really sure of the occasion, although it may very well be that of the previous psalm as well during the time of Absalom's rebellion. And it is another lament. Now, first, just taking a look at the psalm as a lament, we notice all the terms of address. The name Yahweh is uh, used five times. Then we have a couple other addresses in verse 1, God of my righteousness or my righteous God, depending on how you translate that. And verse 2, my honor, may also be a reference to God. Uh, it's not really clear in the text whether it's the psalmist's honor or God as his honor. Then we have request and confidence woven together. The complaint is in verse 2. In Psalm 3, it was how many are my foes. In Psalm, two, Psalm 4, it is how long, how long. So how many, then how long. And verse 3, another expression of confidence. Verses 4 and 5 express some wisdom. This is another feature of laments, that often there will be words of wisdom in the midst of the lament. You might also characterize this as self-talk, as the psalmist speaks to himself, speaks truth in the midst of his crisis. Verse 6, we have another complaint. In this case, it's uh, how many? There are many who say, who will show us some good? In other words, there's nothing good. Uh, going on here. Light up, uh, light up the light of your face, lift up the light of your face. This is a request. And then the psalm concludes with a level of confidence. In terms of the poetry and language, we see that it has the same structure as the previous psalm. Eight verses, four couplets, and a couple of salahs to break those up. We mentioned the, the translation difficulty, O God of my righteousness, or O my righteous God. I like the translation, my righteous God, although David could be speaking here of his own righteousness in this situation. He has been unjustly accused. Uh, therefore, that might lead to that particular translation. Uh, my honor, as we said again, may refer to David's honor or it may refer to God as his honor. In verse 3, it says that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself, set apart, holy, belonging. That's the sense of that word. Verse 4, be angry or be agitated and do not sin. This, again, is an example of self-talk as the psalmist instructs himself in the midst of this crisis. Verse 6 asks, who? Uh, there are many, and who will show us any good? Is there anything good that can come from this situation? Lift up the light of your face is an expression of anthropomorphic morphism, that is, God expressing human characteristics. It is also part of the priestly prayer in the book of Numbers, where the priests would pray, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, and the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I'm drawing from that language. And then finally, we conclude with a metaphor, you put more joy in my heart than when their grain, their new wine abound, joy in the harvest. It's something that we really take for granted these days. We can go to the grocery store and get fresh fruit and vegetables any time of the year, but in the ancient world, uh, that was never a guarantee. You could not preserve things for very long, and so you were dependent every year on a good harvest. So a good harvest was certainly a time of joy. Taking a look at the lens of the author, again, we don't know exactly when this psalm was written. It's likely that it did occur uh, at the same time as the previous psalm, where uh, during the time of Absalom's rebellion, we notice that it is for the director of music, so that means likely that it was used in corporate worship. Moving to the lens of theology, we've already addressed this concept of, of God as a righteous God, a just God, and David declares in this situation that he himself, David, has acted with integrity. Notice in verse 2 how David's honor is linked to God's honor, uh, and both of these have been put to shame by his enemies. And a reminder, theologically speaking, that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. God cares for his people, they belong to him, and they are right to put their trust in him. Verse 5 is this self-talk, it's this wisdom. David tells himself, offer right sacrifices, put your trust in Yahweh. Uh, could, uh, could mean a couple of things. One, it could mean 
simply referring to the, the literal sacrifices, the cultic sacrifices that would be offered, uh, animal sacrifices. Continue to worship, in other words, and put your trust in the Lord. Or other translations will say, offer the sacrifices of righteousness, which would suggest just do what's right. Do what's right in the midst of this injustice that you are experiencing. Uh, verse 6 echoes the the prayer of Moses who who saw the face of God or saw the backside of God actually and uh, glowed uh, because of it uh, of seeing his glory uh, so David is simply praying here uh, Lord show up shine on us let us see your your face reveal yourself in this situation show up and do something uh, for God is a protector God alone is the one that gives us security. From the lens of the editor, we see some similarities between these first uh, uh, pair of laments. They're the same length and structure, eight verses, four couplets. There are common words that link them, sleep, glory, honor. There are also some differences. Psalm 3 is a morning prayer as David wakes up and gives thanks for safety through the night and asks the question, how many are my foes? Psalm 4 is an evening prayer that uh, David would pray before he retires and goes to sleep, and he asks, how long and who can show us any good. How about the lens of Jesus? When we look at verse 4, this uh, statement, be angry, be agitated, but don't sin, uh, we see Jesus modeling this for us when he cleansed the temple. Jesus was angry at the abuses, and yet Jesus was without sin. So the way he handled that anger is a model for us, that he spoke out against injustice and was zealous for the worship of God, but he did so uh, without sinning. And it reminds us uh, that this prayer, lift up the light of your face upon us, is answered by Jesus. In uh, John chapter 1, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. We have seen his face. The glory is the only one. The only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Jesus is the face of God. Jesus uh, shows up and shows us uh, some good uh, in his presence, in his incarnation. How about the New Testament? Well, the New Testament quotes this psalm, verse 4, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Paul writes, be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down in your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Uh, so the, even though it, uh, he only quotes uh, a couple words there, uh, the following phrase, ponder in your own hearts on your beds, uh, suggests this idea of not letting the sun go down. Deal with it quickly. Uh, as, you, as you lay on your bed, uh, ponder it. Ask yourself, are you to blame in any way? Are, are you responsible for this? In other words, just, just think about it. Be, um, be self-controlled when it comes to your tongue. Ponder on your hearts, uh, on, on your beds and your hearts. And then it also uh, reminds me of Matthew 5, 23 and 24, where Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount says, if you're offering your gift at the altar and, and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift which tells us that we need to prioritize reconciliation and to deal with our anger and not let it turn into bitterness. This leads us to our applications of this text. First, the very first verse just tells us again, when we are dealing with injustice, the first place we go is to pray. I've often wondered that the the tone of the psalmist's voice is it a answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness? Is it a is it a cry of, of desperation and petition, or is there some frustration here, like your mother calling you, answer me when I call? Um, I don't know if the psalmist was that impertinent, but it is interesting to to think about. There are moments where where we might be that frustrated and disappointed with God to say, answer me, God. Stop being distant. Be gracious. Hear my prayer. Verse 3 reminds us to put our trust in God, that he indeed uh, treasures us. He has set us apart for himself, and he hears us when we call. Verse 4 reminds us to control our anger and our tongue. It goes right along with that. James 3 says that if you can control your tongue, you can do anything because it's the hardest thing to do. 
So yes, you're going to be angry, agitated, frustrated in that. Do not sin. Control your tongue. Be silent and, and reflect. Verse 5 says, uh, do the right thing. Just do the right thing. Even if you've been wronged, even if your integrity has been impugned, don't compromise. Keep doing what is right and put your trust in the Lord. Verse 7 says, rejoice in the midst of your lament. Uh, look for the harvest. Look for the good and find reasons to rejoice. Uh, I think of Paul and Silas in prison as uh, they were unjustly imprisoned and yet they were singing at midnight. And finally, this uh, wonderful prayer, in peace I both lie down and sleep for you alone. Make me dwell in safety. This was a prayer that we used with our children growing up uh, and when they were uh, putting them down for bed every night. Uh, there was a little song that we sang and uh, it was simply these these words, uh, I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Uh, several years ago, I was out backpacking with my oldest son and um, I love backpacking. I love being outdoors. I'm not, not really afraid of, uh, of animals, you know, critters that might be out there, but Sometimes you run across a two-legged critter that's a little scary, and this was the case. We were backpacking, and there was a there was a guy that just looked really scary, and we didn't see anyone else all day. And uh, for some reason, that that guy kind of got in my head. And as as uh, we we pitched our tent and uh, laid down to go to sleep at night, uh, I just was having these uh, visions of that scary guy lurking in the woods, and you know, I just I was just waiting to hear a chainsaw. Uh, started. And uh, I remember this prayer coming to mind, the same prayer that I prayed over my kids uh, night after night. Uh, now I was praying it for myself for over my irrational fears of a chainsaw killer in the woods. And I remember going to sleep that night uh, over and over saying this prayer. And to this day, on many occasions when uh, I'm going to sleep at night and maybe I'm I'm worried about something. I'm anxious about what's to come the next day. I pray this prayer over and over in my mind until I fall asleep. And I trust that you'll find rest when you pray it as well.